I'm sure today the most popular word is visible, right? And so in the afternoon, let's have a visible discussion. So to make our discussion more visible, first of all, I'd like to uh, share the purpose of the discussion with you. So um, as for the purpose of the discussion, and firstly, I'd like to recap what has been discussed in the morning session. And then let's have a refreshing on our working experience. And also, let's have a refreshing on some of the features of education in Asia. And finally, I'd like to share my interpretation of some of the implication of the visible research. And then we'll um, have a discussion, okay? So, now, um, let's recap what has been discussed in the morning session. So what impresses you most? What surprises you most? Or what can you apply the finding in your own working context? Now, could you please talk to the person less to you and to share your experience or your ideas? And maybe we have one or two minutes for this topic, okay? So what impresses you most or, you know, uh, what do you disagree or what do you agree, etc.? I think from my understanding and what impressed me most is, teach, uh, for example, is about the teacher-student relationship, you know. And I used to be a teacher in high school and at university, and I realized the importance to establish rapport between teachers and students, okay? And do you still remember the effect size of teacher-students relationship? And I think it's about 0.8, uh, 0.7a, right? And another example I think comes from my daughter's experience. You know, uh, so my daughter told me in the junior high, uh, junior high or junior secondary school, and she didn't like maps, and she was not good at maps. And the main reason is she didn't like her maps teacher. So, and um, I think it surprised me, and then um, I'm very excited to find the evidence to see teacher and student relationship is very important. And so, and what about some of the features in Asia? So we need to think about what's happening in our working context and to design whether we can apply the findings from visible research into our work in practice, okay? And I want you to have a small discussion on some features of the education in Asia in terms of curriculum or teaching, learning, assessment and evaluation, or school management, or parents. So, and could you please, again, talk to the person next to you and share your idea. What do you think about the features, some of the senior features in Asia? Okay, please. You can choose one of the aspects, okay? Curriculum, or teaching, or learning, or assessment, or evaluation. What do you think? So what do you think, assessment or evaluation in Asia, or what do you think, the teaching? Any ideas? Okay, so let's share your ideas with your colleagues. Okay, let's come back. And, and I'm sure uh, many changes have uh, taken place in Asia, but still we got some problems in, in the area of education. And for example, take English teaching in Asia as an example for curriculum. I think in most of the countries, so we follow a top-down strategy for the curriculum. And actually, uh, most of the curriculum focus on language and skill rather than other uh, rather generate skills, okay? And for example, teaching, so we encourage the teacher to teach more communicatively, and I think teacher, uh, student-centered teaching is encouraged in Asia, but still we can find in the classroom, um, we, we can find some mechanical teaching, or we can find teachers uh, focus most on grammar. And as for 
assessment and evaluation, I think testing to test is very popular in most of the countries in Asia. It seems that um, doing, preparing uh, the tests or working on the tests or ask the student to do more mechanical exercise is, we, we can say that everywhere, okay? And as for parents, I think uh, most of the parents, especially in the Chinese communicated, uh, community, most of the parents have very great expectation on their children. And many parents want their children to go to the best school and have the best job, okay? That's the reality in Asia or in the Chinese community. And I think to solve the problems, we can't just based on our common sense or our experience. What we need to do is try to find some evidence or find some support from the research. And that's very important for policy, uh, policy makers or for teachers or for principal. So here comes some implication from visible research. And I think it's only my interpretation of the findings from visible research. I'm not going to cover all the areas of um, visible uh, research. And I just want to focus on some um, very hot topics or some most debated issues in Asia. So personally, I've, I'm sure the findings from visible learning will have great impacts on our beliefs and behaviors. So in, especially in terms of some uh, for polit, uh, policy makers, for principal, for teachers, for students, and for parents. And let's see my interpretation. So from Deb's uh, presentation this morning, I learned a lot. And then here, I try to summarize some of the implications from the findings of the research. And firstly, for policymakers. So um, I think for policymakers, the implications lies in two aspects. The first is about assessment and evaluation. I think it's very important. Um, a step to us, uh, formative evaluation is very important in students' assessment practice. But as we can see, in all the documents, especially the documents issued by the educational department, so in, in different countries, we can see the term formative evaluation, actually. For example, in the national curriculum standard, we can see the term formative evaluation. But what does mean, what does Form formative evaluation mean for you? So, I mean, document is one thing, but practice is another. So many teachers realize the, import, uh, the importance of um, um, give the student formative assessment, but how? They have no idea how to achieve the objective, okay? So here, I think formative assessment, maybe we can use, for example, we can use the performance assessment, we can use the classroom assessment, we try to use the portfolio assessment, but in practice, we seldom use formative assessment. But as we can see from the research, and the effect size is very high, you know? So it's quite important. So I'm sure in the curriculum center or in our policy making, uh, we have to highlight this aspect. And the second aspect is something to do with teacher professional development. As we can see from the research, this is a crucial component in our policy planning. And I'm sure in all the documents in um, all the countries in Asia, we do have some plans for, te uh, for teacher professional development. But how? How can we promote teachers' pro uh, professional development? And what? what should we do in this area? I, I think we can draw some implication. And for example, the first, uh, the first implication is about the classroom management skills. So, uh, normally speaking, in Asia, in the teacher training program, we cover different areas. For example, the subject matter knowledge and the pedagogy thing and uh, some other things like how to manage the, the classroom and how to solve the uh, discipline problem, and for example. But classroom management skills can be one of the key topics in our teacher training program. Okay? And for example, how to organize the class, how to organize group work or pair work, how to monitor the process of discussing. 
Okay, something like that is really important. But while teacher subject matter knowledge is less important, so according to the findings from the research. And here, I think I want to highlight is what I mean here, teacher subject matter knowledge, I refers to deep knowledge. It seems that um, we just teach very um, superficial things in the classroom, right? Especially at primary school or in, uh, in uh, junior high school, right? So um, maybe it's not um, a good decision to, to teach a lot of uh, deep knowledge in the teacher training program, okay? And then it's about the methodology. So when we plan the pr uh, professional development program, I think micro-teaching is one of the most effective ways to promote teacher refreshing and improvement. So what, what, do, what do we mean by micro-teaching? I think this term is, I think most of you are familiar with this term, right? We try to ask the teacher to video their lesson and then we have the discussion in a small group and they can have the refreshing. So try to use that. Not, um, so, but in, in, in China, for example, in most of the teacher training programs, so I think we like to use a lecture style training, right? And the speakers stand here in the front and all the teachers just sit there and listen, you know, and no discussion, no participation. So here, micro teaching, maybe we can try more. So, um, here I got a question is, uh, maybe in the discussion part and then we can maybe uh, touch this issue. Like, for example, does teacher matter knowledge have a significant and related effects on students in senior high school? So, what I mean is in senior high school, so we, sometimes we have to teach deep knowledge rather than very surface knowledge. So, does it work in high school? So that's the question for you. Okay, and the second aspect is for principal. So from the findings, um, from the findings, we can um, have some ideas about leadership style and school management. So leadership style is a hot topic here. I think this morning, so one of the participants have has a question about the leadership style. So what's the difference between two styles, you know? So principles are important, of course, I think it's obvious for school development, but instructional leadership has more significant effect. So from my understanding, I think in instructional leadership, it's very popular, maybe in China, so today. So uh, I think from these findings, it does work, and then maybe it leads to more effective students' achievement. So I think we can have further discussion about leadership style later. So the second aspect is about school management. So from the findings, we can uh, learn something about the class size and the streaming students. So class size is really a, a hot topic or debated topic in Asia. So especially in the country such as China, so because we have very large population, normally we have a very, very big class size. And for example, some of the class has 60 students or even 70 students. But many teachers complain because of the big class size, my students have low achievement. So is it true? Actually, from the, uh, from the findings of the research, it's not true. So class size, big class size, is not the main reason for learners' no achievement. From my understanding, teaching strategies are more important. So, and for example, if you teach a class of six, 60 students or 70 students, and then you have to learn to how to organize school work or pair work, and you have to promote the communications between learners. So that's an um, issue we talk about that. Um, I think in China, so now, um, many schools try to uh, promote the students' achievement by reducing class size. So think about that. Think about this decision. Does it work or not? Okay. And the second is about streaming students. So it, it does not make big difference for learners' achievement when the school streams its students. So 
I think it's common for uh, most of the schools in 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 Asia or in China, you know, the school tend to stream the student according to their ability. So sometimes they, they have some class called uh, entitled key class or, you know, the upper level class. But it's not good for the uh, good student or the poor student to improve their achievement. So um, that's why, you know, many parents uh, really want their children to go to the key class, we call it, you know, the, the class with high ability students. So, but it doesn't work from the Friday. Um, I think another issue is, uh, if possible, and now we can talk about the school uniform command. So, in many schools, all the students are required to wear uniform every day. So, is it um, important for students' achievement? So I read the book um, about visible learning research and then and had to mention this uh, issue. And I think it's a hot topic in, in, in Asia. So let's, maybe we can do some research or maybe we can uh, um, express your ideas considering your working contest. Okay, that's the second aspect. The third is for teachers. Uh, so for teachers, I think we can draw many, many implications from the research. So I try to categorize into uh, three aspects. The first, we can learn something about teaching strategies and decision making. And the second part, we can learn something about professional development. And the last, teacher student students' relationship. So from the research, um, we can learn about um, how to teach and what to teach. Okay? I just try to select 14, which I think is relevant to our working contest for you. So for example, about the teaching or problem-solving skill. So it's more effective for high school students. So if you teach at primary school, if you are principal uh, of a primary school, so maybe it's not it's less effective if you promote problem solving skills. And second, teachers are not expected to emphasize learning styles. So remember this morning, so we talk about matching learning style. Students, students, especially young learners, are encouraged to combine different learning strategies. Okay, for me, I think, um, so probably for young learners, especially for learners in primary school, so it's probable they are, that they are so too young to think about learning style mentally, you know, so it's one of the issue I want to raise. And third, learners learn more effectively when working with peers. I think it's obvious. So we need more cooperation in classroom and good work and pair work is encouraged in class. So from the finding, we can see good work will lead to greater achievement for the students. And again, lastly, and scaffolding is important and we, we are encouraged to scaffold learning by providing learners with work examples and guidelines. I think this is important in a classroom and sometimes we find the teacher just simply give some, uh, some task to the student but they never explain, they never give them instruction. So that's why sometimes students have very low achievement. Okay, another five strategies. So F is about feedback. So this one impressed me most as well. So feedback is very important to help the student understand their performance and what to do less. When we talk about visible learning, so we mean we want the student, we want to help the student to know where they are and where to go last. As teachers, if you don't give feedback to students, and I think they have no way to understand what is happening in their learning. Um, I think one of the examples 
uh, surprised me most is um, from, the, from a Chinese newspaper, I learned that some of the primary school students were asked to do a lot of homework during winter holiday. So uh, they complain a lot because, as you know, we have the spring festival during the winter holiday. But they spent about one month on their homework. Finally, when they went back to school, what they received is only two Chinese letters, say, already read, yi <laughs> yue. So all the parents and students were very disappointed, you know, because they spent a huge amount of time and energy on the homework, but no feedback. So, uh, so I think this morning, Deb gave us some suggestions how to, how to give feedback. Right, so let's think about it. And then speak clearly and tell students the lesson learning objectives explicitly. As I did at the beginning, I want to make the discussion visible and that's why I tell you the purpose of the discussion. So, and try to make the student know, try to make the student understand their learning purpose and to learn where they should go. Next is about the classroom discussion. I think it's mentioned in all the documents from all the countries, right, in the curriculum standards. Discussion and get students involved in learning more actively. So through discussion, they can improve their achievement. And next, help students to become autonomous, to be able to articulate learning outcomes, self-report their performance, as we can see in the video this morning. And the kids told his mom what's happening at school, you know, what he has learned. So that's, that's one of our purpose of education, and try to promote autonomy. So the next one is about examination. Teaching to test cannot bring big gains in learner achievement. I really want the policy makers to get access to this kind of evidence. Because as policy makers, at different, uh, uh, we just ask the teacher, please don't teach to test. Please don't give your student too many mechanical exercise. But why? We need to explain, we need the evidence. So try to read this uh, research and then you can understand. So uh, from the data all over the world, they indicate teaching to test cannot give you very positive impact. Actually, teaching to test narrows your curriculum because you just teach what is to be tested in the test. Okay, again, formative assessment. So, because for the policymaker, I mentioned this issue, I will not repeat it again. So, formative assessment should be one of the main assessment modes in daily teaching. And actually, in Guangdong, so in my institution, actually I'm now uh, working on a project is to promote formative assessment in, in the province. And then we want to change the testing culture so in, in our region. So, um, and then more homework is not a guarantee of improvement in learner's performance. So until now, I have no idea why teacher would like to give so much homework to the student. So <laughs> I, I think we need to maybe do a survey for that. Is it a kind of responsibility for teachers to, to give the students so much homework? And last night, I went to the website, I read one of the articles, it's about um, the uh, Chinese primary school students' homework, and the students were asked to, during the holiday, they were asked to do 100 sit-up. You know, why they, they have to do sit-up? Because the PE exam, you know, they asked to do sit up. So every day they asked to do 100 sit up. They asked to copy 50 English words. They asked to write one diary a week of 50 maths problem. They have to work for that. So too much. And what's the significance of the homework? So I think it's a good implication for us teachers or or. or parents. And then do consider managing skills when you plan your lesson. So I think generally for teachers, for you, when you plan your lessons, maybe um, you just consider the purpose of your teaching, or maybe you think about the teaching procedures, 
or you think about the teaching um, methods, you seldom think about the management skill. So, for example, when you organize the group work, how to monitor the progress? If you give an English lesson, how can you push the students to talk in English during the group work? I think it's a kind of management skill. It's important to think about that in your lesson planning. Okay, and next, it's not necessary to provide individual learning programs for each student, a program for learning for each student. Oh, sorry, typo. And then for teacher, so the second aspect is about professional development. I think it's obvious, it's common sense. Professional development is important, but what we need to do is in what way and how? So that's the, the how issue. Maybe we, in our discussion later, we can talk about that, how to promote the professional development. Again, here I want to emphasize micro teaching, okay? Um, the last one is teacher-student's relationship. So establishing a pleasant rapport with students is helpful okay, for students' achievement. So just now when we recap uh, what has been discussed, I told you what impressed me most is this, the data about teacher-student's relationship. I don't think all the teachers realize the importance of this now. At least in practice, I don't think they try their best to improve their relationship. They never, t some of the teachers, they never take time to, to build relationship with the student, to, to build a rapport with the students. But this is important. I think it's to do with the motivation and to do with their learning interests and to do with their sense of being respected. So, especially for, for high school students or maybe for girl students, I think. Because I think girl students sometimes care the sense of being respected. I, I learned this from my daughter, you know, from her experience. Okay, and let's move to the learners. So for learners, what can we, uh, what can we learn from the findings of the research? I think for, uh, this morning I learned two things which is important for learners. And the first is reflect on what study skills you're using and try to combine different strategies in learning. And for most of the students, they have no sense what strategy is. I think in most of the documents, uh, uh, for example, in, in the curriculum standard, we encourage the student to use more strategy. For example, use cognitive strategy or metacognitive strategy or resource strategies. And as teachers or as principal or as policy makers, so before we made the decision, we have to learn what strategy is, and we have to maybe list some strategy which is useful for learners. And on the other hand, I think what we need to do is to encourage the student to find their own strategy or to find the effective strategies for themselves. Okay. Is, so this part is about study skills and strategies. Okay, last is for parents. So what can we learn? So as parents, I think some of you are parents here. I think when I, uh, when I read the book, I'm very impressed by this part about the um, implications for parents. So the first is understanding of schooling and learning. So in this aspect, and I think we got some idea, for example, sending the children to summer school does not have a significant influence on their achievement. Summer school. Summer school is very popular in Asia, or especially in China. So I think all the students are very busy during summer holiday or during winter holiday, you know. They go to summer school, uh, they go to language class, they go to drawing class, and, but it does not have great impact on their achievement. So generally, I think from the data all around the world, but it, I, I think from my points of view, it depends on what, is, uh, what you learn in summer school, right? And how they teach at summer school. 
So the second part is uh, parents are encouraged to make investment in time and energy in their children's early stage education. Early stage education is very popular in Asia because for most of the parents, they have great expectation on their children. They want their children to go to the best school in the region. From the data, we can see it did have positive impact on students' achievement. So for, for me, I, I, I can't go bad because now my daughter is 16 years old and then I think if I, I, I know this research and then I, I read the research before and then maybe I have um, right decision and I try to spend time um, for her early stage education. So um, then uh, the second aspect is about the involvement. Spend more time with children and be involved actively in their learning. I'm trying to do it and then to see whether it leads to the student's achievement. Okay, and here I got another discussion point is, is there any evidence to support the idea that school choice is related closely to children's achievement? So what do you think about that? I think we can uh, have some implication from the research. Because I think school choice is a very hot topic in Asia, and many, uh, you know, many parents, um, they, they really just want their children to go to uh, primary school or public school, you know, and the key school or the normal school. So school choice. So it's another topic. So we need to consider. Okay, so besides what has been discussed this morning, and some other variables described in visible learning research, I think we need to have further discussion because it provides evidence for decision making and guidelines for current practice. So these variables include, so for example, vocabulary programs. As we can see, the effect size is up to 0.67. So vocabulary programs, especially for language subject, English or Chinese or another country, maybe your mother tongue, okay? Fullness instruction. Take English teaching as an example in China. So according to the national curriculum standard, teachers are not encouraged to teach fullness. So shall we change the decision or shall we need to go to the research and think about that. Uh, another one is the use of calculators. So why I'm interested in this variable? Because I think in some of the primary school or, or uh, um, junior high school, some uh, uh, the students can use calculators even when they have the examination. So shall we allow the student to use the calculators? But as we can see, the effect size is 0.27. That means it has negative impacts on students' achievement. The fourth is the outdoor adventure programs. So 0.52. That means outdoor programs have positive impacts on students' achievement. I think this uh, issue is extremely important for Chinese policy maker. So as we can see now in practice for school, for whatever reason, so we seldom organize the outdoor programs for students or we never organize the adventure programs for students. So the next one is about bilingual programs. So some of the school try to run some bilingual programs but does it work? It's popular, but not many people think about the evidence from research. So as we can see, it's 0.37. So that means not very great impact on students' achievement. And then frequency or effects of testing. I think this uh, finding is really useful or important for the teachers in Asia because I think in Asian context, so testing to test is very popular. 
So I think we need to think about that from the research. And last is about peer um, tutoring, so 0.55. So that means great impact, okay? I think in the discussion session, and you can talk about this. Okay, last, um, I want to raise some more questions for you. So in the discussion part, so the first is about the reforms or the innovations in your countries. What do you think have made to promote students' learning? What you have done and is effective and it works? And the second is about the problems, how to solve the problem. What can you learn from the findings and, and how to make your decision? The last one, in what way you can apply the findings to improve your policy making or teaching practice, okay? Um, I think that's all for my um, talk. So I really want to um, share my ideas about the interpretation of the finding. So now, uh, actually, it's your time to share your ideas with your colleagues you know, or your friends. Now let me hand over to Isabel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.